Hi, I just uploaded the last two and I'm going to do two more and I'm going to try and get a couple more after that so you guys can sit there for a long time and listen to me read this story. It's a good story. Remember, it's just a story. There's nothing that's true about it. Chapter 8, called The Code. Ouch, that stings, Jason complained. Good, I'm glad, Julie replied, applying more hydrogen peroxide to her brother's wounds. It serves you right for almost getting yourself killed. And she paused before she added, it would have ruined my entire weekend. That's a sister for you. You're enjoying this, Jason muttered. Julia smiled and then dabbed him with more peroxide. Yes, I think I am, she says. Rick just shook his head watching these two interact, made him wish he had a brother or a sister. Julia stepped back to take a look at her patient. Jason sat at the kitchen table, shirtless. He looked like a mess from the fall, but none of the scrapes were deep. Jason turned to Rick. Have you figured out what that is yet? On the table between him, there was this mysterious object Jason had pulled, had found hidden inside the cliff. Rick slowly pulled at the cloth that was wrapped around the mysterious box. It's like their bandages are, or I should say were bandages, Rick commented. He slowly unraveled the cloth as if it were peeling an apple. It's a wooden box, Jason whispered. Cool, Rick said, and pressed on the upper panel of the box, and it slid sideways. It opens up. Jason and Julia leaned forward. What is that stuff? Jason asked. It was a mystery, all right. Inside the box, there were dozens of little brown balls that seemed to be made of clay. How odd. How disappointing. Julia deadpanned, oh joy, you found an old box of chocolate-covered cherries. I'll alert the media. Rick poked his finger inside the box, and underneath the balls was a small tube of parchment tied with a string, and it looked ancient. Careful, murmured Jason as Rick lifted it from the box. Rick very slowly untied the parchment. He carefully unrolled the yellow paper onto the table, and on it were various symbols. If I get that close enough, you guys can see that or not. I hope so. Julia looked from the paper to the puzzled faces of her two friends. Can anybody here read Egyptian? Nestor was working in the greenhouse where he'd taken refuge after the brief afternoon rain, and the old man had always enjoyed it there, especially during a rain when the water drummed against the sloping windows of the greenhouse. Now the sun shone through, the clouds glistening on the drops of rain that still clung to the grass and the flowers. He was not worried about Julia, Jason, and Rick. Wet from the ocean, wet from the rain, he thought. In the end, there's really no difference. But now Nestor saw them gathered outside the greenhouse, anxiously waiting for him to finish his work. He turned his back to them for several minutes, completed the task at hand, then cleaned up and joined them outside. What do you want, he asked. I have work to do. Julia elbowed her brother. Ow, he complained. She'd forgotten about his scrapes, and Jason looked to the sky and to the ground anywhere but to the old man. Finally, he spoke. I was wondering, I mean, we were wondering, well, since you lived here for a while and everything, Julia thought we should ask, and, and you see this thing is, Nestor tapped his foot impatiently. He pretended to check the time on his imaginary wristwatch. Is this going to take all afternoon? Jason thrust the parchment into Nestor's hands. We found this, he said, and we were kind of thinking that maybe you might know how to read it. Nestor observed the three kids closely, Rick, clear-eyed and pragmatic, Jason, nervous and dreamy, but full of hope and determination, and Julia, sharp-witted and tough. Nestor rolled open the parchment. How did you get this? His tone was deadly serious. They led Nestor to the edge of the cliff, where the steps began their descent. Jason explained how he had slipped and pointed to where he found the box. He glossed over the details of the fall, leaving out how close he'd been to tumbling to his death. The last thing he needed was for his overprotective mother to find out that. She'd never let him out of the house again. Nestor listened to Jason's tale with rapt attention. And when Jason finished his story, the caretaker stood quietly thinking. He seemed to be listening to the waves as they crashed against the rocks. But to Rick, it felt as if the old man was trying to make up his mind about something. Finally, Nestor returned the parchment to Jason. He shook his head. I don't know what it means. I really have no idea at all. But it's writing of some kind, don't you think? Jason countered like hi hieroglyphics, maybe. Nestor scowled. I've seen hieroglyphic writing. He replied, it does not look like these uh, silly doodles. Doodles, Jason echoed in disbelief. It looks more, looks like more than just doodles to me. 
Rick chimed in, Nestor's right, Jason, it can't be hieroglyphic writing. That's Egyptian. This paper is parchment, and the ancient Egyptians wrote on papyrus. Plus, I doubt any kind of an Egyptian came all the way to this part of England just to hide a secret message. Why not, Jason asked, because they weren't good sailors, Rick responded. The Egyptians had boats made of woven reeds, which were good for floating along the Nile, but they could never have endured a rough passage across an open sea. Nestor gave Rick an appreciative nod. He was clever, that one. And like so many boys who grew up in Kilmore Cove, Rick obviously had a fascination with the sea. This one is promising, he thought. There's hope for this boy. Maybe it's just a practical joke, Julie offered, a prank or something. Well, that's just plain out ridiculous, Jason huffed. This box must be important. Why else would somebody hide it inside a cliff? It has to mean something. Julia crossed her arms. It doesn't have to mean anything. Maybe it's some sort of map or secret passage, Jason asked. Maybe an old pirate made Kilmore Cove his base and hid his treasures somewhere around here. Julia rolled her eyes. Great, just great. Great, first ghost, now a pirate. What's next, Jason? A little green man from Mars? No, the caretaker began, then shook his head. No, no, it can't be. Perhaps what, Jason said. Listen, Nestor turned to Jason. Forget all this talk of treasures and secret passages and messages. This is all a fantasy. Perhaps what, Jason repeated once more. He was insistent. What are you going to say? Nestor sighed, surrendering to the boy's determination. Ulysses Moore was a student of ancient languages, the old man told him. He had many books about secret writings and codes and lost languages. I myself don't understand any of it, but if you wish, I'm sure you could look into Mr. Moore's library, and maybe with the help of those books, you could find out the meaning of the message. Jason's eyes widened. Woo! He was surprised by Nestor's sudden, unexpected help. Really? Um, um, thanks. Thanks a lot. Some mystery, Julia muttered. It sounds like homework to me, but she followed her brother and Rick as they ran toward the house. Chapter 9, The Library. The library was on the second floor. It was an impressive room, like a shrine to human knowledge. Its ceiling was painted with red and blue medallions. Natural light flooded in from two large windows that overlooked the courtyard gardens. Bookshelves filled every wall from floor to ceiling, and there was a soft covered, there was a sofa covered with what appeared to be buffalo skin. Ugh. A gorgeous grand piano and several overstuffed armchairs. Various sections of the bookshelves were labeled with copper plaques that indicated the book's topics like history or medicine or geography and so on. The three immediately set out to find the books Nestor had described. It must be in this section here, Julia decided at some point. What does it say? She says, it says paleography. Pale oh, what? Rick said. If I remember correctly, Julie explained, in Greek, paleo means ancient, like paleolithic man, or and graphia, or graphy, means writing. Rick looked at her impressed. Well, you're just full of surprises. And Julia shrugged. I try. Rick was the tallest among them, so he got up on his tiptoes and picked a thick book up entitled Dictionary of Forgotten Languages. This book looks promising, he said, and he quickly leafed through the pages. There were dozens of images and symbols that reconstructed ancient forms of writing. The Phoenician alphabet and Indian alphabet, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and the mysterious Estrusian language, the Greek alphabet, the unknown Ronogorogongo script from Easter Island, and many others. Every page contained symbols and drawings and secret codes and lost languages. It was like a treasury of everything that man had once known but had forgotten over the centuries. As Rick turned the pages, Jason suddenly reached over and pointed, Wait! There it is! In the middle of the two pages was this drawing. It's a very light drawing, but maybe you can see just a little bit of it. I don't know why they did the illustrations in pencil. Above it were the words, the symbols of the Paosto disc. It sure looks like these, Julia said. Rick read aloud. These are the 45 mysterious figures depicted on the so-called Phaeostos disc. This object, a crudely rounded clay disc, was discovered on the Isle of Crete at the beginning of the 20th century by archaeologist Halber and Panier and has never been deciphered. Keep going, Julia whispered. She was getting swept up in the mystery in spite of herself. On both sides, on both of its sides, the disc bears an inscription arranged in a spiral like a coiled snake. 
The letters that accompany the individual pictograms are part of an attempt to create a phonetic translation. This was done by paleographer Elton Carter. Beside each symbol or figure was its corresponding significance with the character of the alphabet. I get it, Jason said. The walking man indicates the number one. The disc with the dots is the letter A. He smoothed the parchment onto the table beside the dictionary. Rick shook his head. Well, it won't be that easy. He stated, it's not enough to know the meaning of the letters to decipher an ancient language. We also need to know the language it's written in. For all we know, this message could be written in ancient Greek. What makes you show so sure it's ancient? Julia questioned. Isn't it obvious, Rick replied. He pointed to the text in red. The characters in the Phileostus disc were used thousands of years before the birth of Christ. The twins, however, refused to give up so easily. They began to write down the phonetic translation of each of the par parchment's hieroglyphics. Julia grinned at Rick. Hey, there's no harm in trying, she explained with a shrug. It's a note saying we won the lottery. When, cried Jason, translating the first four characters. Rick continued to shake his head doubtfully. The, cried Julia, as they finished the second word. It does mean something, Jason explained. The twins looked at each other and then at Rick, who stared back at them in awe. How could this be? Could the parchment contain a message in their own language, but written using an unknown alphabet? Why in the world would somebody do something like that? They were to soon be able to read the incomplete line out loud. When the grotto's darkness seems defeat, these earth lights. And then at the worst possible moment, their pen ran out of ink. Oh, great, complained Jason, shaking it furiously. Find another pen, he ordered Julia. Excuse me, Julia said, who died and anointed you king? Well, I don't know where to find a pen, Jason snapped. It could take hours to find one in this place. Where's the one you were using to draw the map? Jason, Rick intervened. Jason thought for a moment, picturing it. He remembered that he dropped it and it had rolled. Yes, beneath the big arm wire. It's downstairs. I'll be right back. Jason flew down the stairs and toward the stone room, and then he stopped suddenly. A shadow had passed before him, seemingly out of nowhere. He was unable to speak. Something was, or someone, was in the house with them. From upstairs, muffled by the distance, came the voice of his sister and Rick. Jason could hear their words. When the grotto's darkness seems defeat, these earthly lights you may use. Gradually, Jason's sense of panic faded away. He looked around carefully, but didn't see anything suspicious. Maybe it was just his imagination again. A simple trick of the mind, or was it something he was able to feel? He cautiously made his way to the stone room. Lying on the floor was the map they'd abandoned when they'd gone in search for the portrait of Ulysses. He crossed to the other side of the room, his senses alert. He kneed, kneeled down beside the armoire, which is like a big dresser, guys, and felt underneath it for the pen. Unfortunately, it rolled all the way to the back of the farthest edge against the wall. Jason strained to reach the pen. He noticed something. The wall behind the dresser wasn't a wall at all. It felt different. It felt rough hewn and wooden. No, it wasn't a wall at all. Curious, Jason stood up and tried to move that enormous piece of furniture. It was very heavy, but he was able to shift it just far enough to get a better look at what lay behind it. It was a door. When Jason turned, returned to the library, he handed the pen to Julia. Then he stood off to the side, troubled and thoughtful. While she and Rick finished translating the entire passage, Julia rewrote it on four lines like a poem and read it out loud with a triumphant voice. When the grotto's darkness seems defeat, these earthly lights you may use to shine a light upon the fleet that takes you where you choose. What does that mean, Rick wondered. It was easier to understand before we translated it. Yeah, well, what the heck is a grotto? Is that, ca is that a cave or something? Exactly, Rick answered. It's like a cave or a cavern. There must be grottos all over this area, Jason thought said thoughtfully. I've been digging around caves my whole life, Rick said. All the kids around here do it. Julia smirked. That's because there's nothing better to do than kill more cove. Go to the mall? Nope. The movies? Mm, no. How about the museum and then a free concert in the park? Uh, no. Interesting, hey? I got it. Let's all crawl around in the dark, disgusting caves all day long. Rick was slightly offended. Sorry, we're not the city type, Julia. You'll have to go somewhere else to find crime and pollution. Maybe I will, she shot back. Guys, guys, Jason interrupted. Save the country mouse, city mouse argument for later. Let's get back to the grotto. Julia and Rick laughed. Jason was right. 
Okay, well, there's a local legend, Rick began, that the ancient Druids used to meet in Kilmore Cove during spring equinox. Okay, so Druids are a priest from an ancient religion, and equinox is when we change the time on the clocks, guys, when it becomes spring and fall and summer and winter. Supposedly, their secret place was a grotto by the sea, but it collapsed or it was destroyed during the Roman invasion thousands of years ago. Druids? Cool, Julia exclaimed. Once again, she couldn't help but be drawn into the mystery. And she listened closely as Rick had tried to remember other local tales that mentioned grottos or fleets, desperately trying to make sense of the word earth lights. Jason, on the other hand, seemed strangely detached and remote. It seemed as if his mind was somewhere else. Jason, Julia asked, are you okay? You seem so out of it. Maybe you ought to lay down and rest. Jason's eyes came back into focus and he shook his head, trying to snap out of it. Julia stared hard at him. You're freaking me out, a little Jason. Here we are with a real mystery to solve and you're staring off into space like a zombie from the B-movies. She snapped her fingers. Wake up! Did you hear what Rick said about the druids? I heard you, he muttered. Druids. Julia continued. Rick said there was once a big grotto in Kilmore Cove where the druids held their secret gatherings. I know, Jason said softly. I've seen it. What? I know where it is, Jason told him. What do you mean you know where it is, Rick said. How could you possibly know that? Jason looked at Rick and then at Julie, and he gave a slight shrug. He said, I don't know how I know, but I swear to you, I'm sure I just know. <laughs>